Well, at least the Taliban gave him a toothbrush. Hi, this is Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle now. And Bill, uh, the- Okay, we have to stop. That is without question. Uh, we've done almost 200 shows. That is the best introduction by far, absolutely. Well, I have to credit the New York Times for this. The Gray Lady has published a story talking about the argument made by a Justice Department official in front of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals about the conditions in border detention camps uh, run by uh, CPB, CBP, which I think is Customs and Border Patrol. Um, and the allegation is that these conditions are not safe and sanitary and the evidence uh, allegedly is that toothbrushes, soap, and blankets are not being provided in adequate quantity or, or at all in some cases. Um, the New York Times trots out several people who said that they were in detention from other governments, in one case the Taliban, in another case the Iranian government, in a third case the Somali pirates, and um, they say things like, well, you know, the conditions weren't great where I was, but we had certain minimum things. Uh, for example, we had a toothbrush. I could take a shower every couple of days. They gave The Taliban gave me soap, says one of these uh, former detainees. Um, this is actually a case bill that started during the Obama administration, but the Trump administration decided to bring the appeal and basically say it doesn't necessarily have to be that the government provides toothbrushes, blankets, and soap to children that are expected, in their words, to be in detention for a relatively brief period of time. Um, this isn't who we are, is it, Bill? <laughs> no, God knows. Uh, the distinction between um, being overwhelmed by millions and millions of illegal aliens uh, who we constantly let into the border without warning shots or anything else, the fact that we're not able to supply an adequate number of toothbrushes to them is really essentially no different than the Germans just burning a village to the ground and murdering everybody in it because somebody shot um, Heydrich. It's, it's essentially just the same moral uh, ground, Scotty. Uh, my first uh, response to this would be to the, to the uh, gentlemen or gentlemen who um, feel they got treated better under the Taliban. I think just in the interest of, of fundamental human decency, we should release those people and let them go back to Tal Taliban captivity so they can see an increase in standard of living. Well, they're not now, saying they got treated better under the Taliban, but they're they saying that those, so those minimum standards thing. were met. And basically what they're doing is they're saying the United States is not like the Taliban. It's not like Iran. It's not like Somali pirates. Why are we not providing these minimal basic necessities of hygiene? Well, well probably, warmth. Scott, probably we're not providing them because we are so overwhelmed by the numbers. That's probably the reason. I don't know what the number of people that come over the border illegally is every day, but it's certainly a gigantic number. I wouldn't want to be paying for the toothbrushes that have to be issued to, to this situation. We don't know that this is an endemic problem. We don't know it's a problem that's been going on forever. We know a couple people said they didn't get toothbrushes, therefore Donald Trump's a monster. But look, I have a very simple theory about this kind of thing, and that is if you're not, if you don't want to be deprived of your toothbrush or other details like that, maybe you shouldn't just walk into somebody else's country and end up in their prisons. That's just my take on it. If I if I were to go to Mexico, just walk across and, and Mexican police pick me up and they put me in a cell and the cell wasn't air conditioned, let's say. I don't see how I have a, a, a grievance against the Mexican government for not treating me better when all I've done is simply violate their most fundamental law. We're not talking about, look, if we were talking about these people really being ill, if there was typhus, if there was anything like that, that'd be a different story. But there is no typhus at the border. If you want to find typhus and bubonic plague, you have to go to downtown Los Angeles. But this idea that, we, that we've that we been able to find a few people who didn't get toothbrushes for how long, do we know? That this that this whole thing is is just treating these people like animals is number one deceptive. Number two, it is it is to ignore the entire causality of the point. Why are they not getting toothbrushes? Well, because there's so damn many of them coming over the border, breaking the law immediately. That we're a little tight on toothbrushes for the well, moment. Well, that's not the argument this, they're making. This kind Bill. of thing I saw in in Guantanamo Bay right after 9/11. I saw pictures of these guys. Uh, these uh, uh, Taliban uh, terrorists and so on, right, right after 9/11, and you would see pictures of them in their orange jumpsuits, and they're kept behind these dog cages, and there's, you know, and there's um, a concertina wire around the top, and it makes it look like that, like we're treating them like zoo animals. Well, that was Camp X-ray. It was in existence for about four or five months while we built a facility 
which is now called uh, Camp uh, Delta, I think, down in Gitmo, which of course is air conditioned, which of course has signs indicating the direction of, of uh, Mecca so that they can bow in the right direction when they're, when they're having their, uh, their prayers. There's an MRI at Camp Delta for the terrorists, but if you have to have an MRI uh, needed and you're a member of the U.S. military, you got to get on a plane and fly up to Jacksonville. So I am not impressed by these arguments where you find one or two cases of something that is relatively minor as an indictment of the American system and who we are and aren't we better than this and all the rest of this junk I hear all the time. The treatment you get in a county jail is not particularly great. And I'd be willing to bet you anything that if you had a choice to go to one of these detention camps uh, where the toothbrush uh, shortage is or spend a night in the, in the lockup in downtown Chicago, I know which one I would rather take. Well, Bill, let me make it specific about what the government is appealing. The Justice Department uh, lawyer is basically saying a couple of things. First of all, at issue is whether the conditions are safe and sanitary. Um, according to uh, the agency that manages this, and I misspoke earlier, it's actually Customs and Border Protection, CBP. Um, the agency said on Tuesday of this week that children in custody receive, quote, continuous access to hygiene products and adequate food. However, reports have surfaced recently describing U.S. detainees in behind chain link fencing, sleeping on concrete, covered in blankets made of aluminum foil. I, this is probably not f aluminum foil. But I know what it is, a mylar yes, blanket. Yes, those yeah. kind of plastic blankets. Um, and, uh, and the allegation is that they don't have continuous access to, to hygiene products. So the government's argument is basically two things. Uh, number one, they're not supposed to be in detention of that agency in these short-term facilities for very long. So even if the government were not providing these things, it doesn't violate the 1997 agreement that the government should provide uh, these items to them. But they're further arguing that in 1997, it was never specified what constituted safe and sanitary conditions. Now, the three-judge panel that was grilling this uh, Justice Department attorney basically said, well, don't you think that blankets and toothbrushes and soap are considered to be part of safe and sanitary? And the attorney said, said the government, it was not negotiated at the time. And one of the judges said, well, maybe that's because it was obvious. I'm not entirely sure I get the point here. Okay, so the point, Bill, is that it looks like the government, starting in the Obama administration and now during the Trump administration, is is basically making the argument that we don't we don't have to provide this. It's short term detention, and uh, even if it was longer term detention, there's no specific thing under the law. And I think the left is basically saying the law be damned, as they might normally do, the law be damned, we're Americans. We take care of children. Since October, some 51,000 unaccompanied minors have come across the U.S. border that we're aware of. Don't we take care of these people in better conditions than this? The fact that they've got Mylar blankets is telling me that we have used all of the resources available for this invasion wave, and now we're being forced to use the kind of things that can be distributed from helicopters to people after earthquakes and floods. That's what that tells me. If people are sleeping on concrete, that's not because we decided to just simply kick them out of the beds. If they're sleeping on concrete, it's because there are so many of them that we simply can't deal with the overflow. So what is the answer to this? What does the left want us to do? Do they want us to, I, I thought they were against this whole idea of building prisons, but apparently not. Apparently we should put in far more facilities. We should just open up uh, rooms for hundreds of thousands of people to be maintained indefinitely before they are either let into the country with amnesty or given a, a slap on the wrist and sent back home. This idea that that somehow America is 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 some kind of uh, moral monster for not providing enough toothbrushes and sleeping space for an actual army of people coming into this country illegally every single day does not wash with me. It doesn't. What it's telling me is, is that this country is so decent that it has run out of facilities, it has run out of supplies, it has run out of just about all the room it has that had already been allocated to this invasion, and the invasion continues. If you don't want your 10-year-old kid to go without a toothbrush for a day or two, my strong recommendation to you as a parent would be do not send them across 10 or 15 or 20 miles of open desert in the middle of the night to cross into somebody else's country illegally. That's the advice I would give you if you're so concerned about your 10-year-old child. And, and to, to blame this on 
either um, either Trump or Republicans or the government or ICE or whatever. You know, I'm not a huge um, I'm not a huge booster of the federal government uh, most of the time. But in a case like this, this sounds to me like a, a pretty clear cut case of, of this agency being overwhelmed by a problem that is much bigger than this. And Scott, look, here's the thing about all of this. And, and it's uh, I've mentioned it before. It's if it is it is the entire purpose of the left to eliminate from the discussion any idea of causality in terms of who did what to who, who did what first, who started it, who's responsible. That's the entire goal is to say that nobody's responsible here. I mean, these people just showed up, you know, it's our own fault for having, uh, you know, an open house and we didn't have enough food for everybody. The responsibility for the treatment of the people who are going illegally into somebody else's country is the responsibility of the people who are breaking the law. Now, if I were to tell you, I've used this analogy before, but it needs to be said. This is something I think that even a progressive can understand. Let's say that you, uh, your, your tenured professor at, uh, at UC Berkeley, your wife who's a, a feminist author and, and your son who's a graphic designer, and then you have two little kids who you adopted from some other land undoubtedly. You five of you have decided that you wanna go on vacation to Japan. And through some little piece of ledger domain or quick thinking or maybe just a little diversion or something, you on, on you know, United Airlines in San Francisco airport managed to get your family on board that plane without passports. You fly across the Pacific Ocean, you get off of the airplane, you go to customs in Japan, they ask you for your passports, and you say, we don't have any. So if you do that, they're gonna take the parents someplace, the kids are gonna go someplace else, and you know who's responsible for this separation of families? The Prime Minister of Japan is, obviously. Obviously, it's his responsibility, it's his fault. What a monster. Well, Bill, it, while what you say may seem to be painfully logical and obvious to people of a conservative mindset, a lot of Americans are not that deep into the logic and constitutionality and the aspects of the law that, that apply in this situation and would just be looking at this situation and saying two things. Number one, their children. And number two, well, gee, I have neighbors who are from Mexico or Guatemala or Honduras and the guy at the restaurant last night and the guy who's mowing my lawn right now. Uh, these, this isn't an invading army. These are people just looking for opportunity. They want to be happy like you and me. Mm -hmm. We should treat them with dignity, whether they're staying or leaving. Oh, we treat them with dignity, Scott. We treat them with dignity. One of the many ways that countries that don't treat people with dignity uh, deal with uh, uh, this kind of invasion of, of refugees is to, is to fire some rounds at them, which usually puts an end to the entire uh, transaction pretty quickly. We're not doing that. We're not handcuffing these people with uh, in manacles and marching them down and putting them to work on a chain gang. We're not, we're not leaving them in conditions. And this is the thing that just cannot be said more uh, often enough. We are treating the people who come illegally into this country, and I mean on two orders of magnitude better, then we treat the people that live in Los Angeles and San Francisco, both of which have been run by Democrats forever, both of which have feces all over the entire city, both of which have mountains of trash that are visible from space. There are bubonic plague cases coming from rats in downtown Los Angeles right now, just over that hill, right now. So I would be willing to bet you, I'd be willing to bet you my life that if you had a choice of walking freely through the streets of democratically run San Francisco or democratically run Los Angeles, or you had a choice of the sanitary facilities at any one of these detention centers, I don't think there's any question of a doubt which one is by a two orders of magnitude more sanitary. Now look, that's not to say that that's okay for tetanus to be there and, and plague to be there at the border, because it's not there at the border. But it is to say that there are limits to resources and to, and to say that, that it's our fault for not having a million toothbrushes in place instead of 400,000 of them is an argument I simply don't buy when it comes to the moral fiber of the country. I mean, this is the problem. And, and this problem is not created by people. And to those people who would say, well, I don't know why they can't just let them come into the country and work. I would say to you, you probably need to spend a weekend 
on the border, on the U.S. side of the border. You need to spend a weekend sleeping in a house where pretty much every night you can hear people outside, where people are rattling your doors, people breaking into your house for water and food. You need to spend a weekend among the people who have to live with the consequences of your, of your uh, virtue signaling, and then you tell me how you feel about it. I can already tell you how celebrities feel about it. I know how Mark Zuckerberg feels about it because Zuckerberg says, my God, we should let everybody into this country. Who are we to keep people out of America? This is the land of freedom and opportunity. Open the borders and let them in. That's precisely Mark Zuckerberg's position. Mark Zuckerberg does not just have private security, armed security, all around his house. Zuckerberg bought every single property around his house to create a no man's land buffer zone to protect him from anybody, not only getting close to his house, but even looking in the window. So when Mark Zuckerberg and, and Shirley Theron and, and J Jessica Alba and all the rest of them, when they are willing to open their house with a sign that says, welcome anyone, and I go around town and post flyers showing the exact location where they can go, when they're willing to do that, when they're willing to do for their own houses and their own lives the things that they're asking other Americans to do, I still think it's insane, but at the very least, you got to give them credit for having some degree of personal integrity. Analyzing breaking news of the day in the context of time-tested principles, Bill Whittle now comes to you five times a week, and it's just part of a whole menu of shows at BillWhittle.com that are funded entirely by, almost entirely, except there's still a little drip, drip, drip coming in from YouTube ad revenue, which they're trying to turn off the spigot on as rapidly as they can. But the members at BillWhittle.com have funded this enterprise and made it possible for you to enjoy this. If you're not yet one of them, you can go to BillWhittle.com and click that Become a Member link. So in, th in gratitude to the members, I am Scott Ott with Bill Whittle. Thank you.